Hey, everybody, welcome. It's back. That's right. The Ferrario face-off is back on ClavesOnline.com as hockey season is underway. And without further ado, we say hello to Alex Ferrario, who you can hear him on ESPN 101.1 here in St. Louis and also uh, on the Blues Radio Network. But, Alex, uh, first of all, it's good to see you again. And, man, we have so much to talk about with the St. Louis Blues and what they're doing. But I think the big story of the day is what's going on in Chicago. Not only do they have COVID that's running rampant, but now they're going to look for a new general manager. Stan Bowman resigns today because of the fact that he was uh, involved in the uh, sexual misconduct allegations that took place with this team a few years ago. Apparently he knew what was going on and he's going to pay the price. Yeah, Claves, it's awesome to be back with you this year. But uh, this Chicago thing is crazy. I mean, they already haven't gotten off to a great start. I believe they set a record in, in franchise history for most games started in the season without a lead. The The fans were calling for Jeremy Colleton's job the other night at United Center. And then on top of it, now you get these allegations that are being uncovered. And Stan Bowman steps aside, who basically was the one that was the originator of moving on from Joel Quenville and bringing in Jeremy Colleton. Um, and there's more. And I think the repercussions are going to continue with this because, you know, Joel Quenville was a part of this team. Kevin Shevel Dayoff, they both were um, spoken of in those uh, in basically the the files that were released from the NHL and the investigation. So um, this 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 is tough for the Chicago Blackhawks that already have started off on the bad foot. And like you mentioned, they're dealing with COVID. I think they got seven or eight guys that are on the COVID protocol list that aren't going to be available for them. They may not be able to, to put a full team on the ice. So things don't get easier for Chicago right now. So let me run this by you then, because I know the NHL was steadfast when they came out with their COVID rules about if you didn't have enough to feel the team, nobody gets paid. Uh, yeah. It's a forfeit. Uh, are we are we teetering on that situation now where maybe they don't have a game? And, and if they don't play, that means the Blues don't play, which means nobody gets paid. I mean, I would imagine you have to be getting closer to that if you don't have enough guys. The luxury for the Chicago Blackhawks are that they trimmed off a lot of that salary cap this offseason when they moved on from Duncan Keith. Now, I know that they signed Seth Jones to that contract extension. They might have a little bit more wiggle room than, say, you know, if the Toronto Maple Leafs or the Colorado Avalanche were in this situation where they couldn't get more players. But, I mean, if Colorado doesn't have enough guys, they're either going to have to move the majority of these guys onto LTIR, which means they're going to be without them for at least seven to ten days, or you're going to have to call guys up and have them as healthy scratches but you can only allocate so many guys on your NHL roster without having to send guys down to waivers. So Chicago is going to be in an interesting situation here. Now, some of this with the COVID protocol, some guys, we remember last year, Claves, where Zach Sanford and Sammy Blay both had that false positive where they did the test. It came back positive. They put them in the protocol. I believe it was 24 or 48 hours later that they got the negatives that they needed to. And then they came out of quarantine. So, um, for Chicago, maybe the, a couple of these guys are able to come out of the COVID protocol. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you've got to be towing the line if you're the Chicago Blackhawks, especially with all of this stuff, to where you might not be able to put together a full NHL roster. I'll tell you one thing. When you think about Chicago sports, you got the Blackhawks. The Bears are going no place fast. The Cubs yep. were a disaster. The White Sox got in but got knocked off early. And the Bulls are just getting off to a, a reasonable start. Well, they have the best start they've had since Michael Jordan was there. Uh, it, this could be a cold winter in Chicago. <laughs> That's saying something for the Windy City. It's sad to say that out of all the Chicago sports right now, the Bulls, are the ones that are probably yeah. the most intriguing. And that's disappointing for the Blackhawks, Glaze, because there were so many national analysts that said, oh, the Blackhawks are a clear-cut playoff team this year. And Marc-Andre Fleury comes in. <laughs> Seth Jones gets the contract extension. Jonathan Taves returns. They get J Tyler Johnson. I, I never bought into the Chicago Blackhawks because you can add pieces here and there. But it does, you're, you're basically trying to just put a bunch of pieces together and hope that that puzzle is solved but you're not looking at the puzzle piece at a whole and say, oh, yeah, this all comes together as a flow. Yeah. You're just trying to hope it fixes. And Marc-Andre Fleury just looks – he looks displaced right now with this team in front of him. Well, you know, to, to wrap up on Chicago, um, they had a very interesting season last year, a, a shortened season, um, accounted for themselves okay in the playoffs, and I think there was a lot of hope. But I think you touched on something, man. You, you basically have a collection of players. 
yeah. who really don't know each other, who come from different organizations and different systems. And it's going to take time. And now with COVID uh, invading their situation, uh, who knows if they'll ever pull it together. But if you're their coach, man, uh, you might be renting from week to week at this point because it has not gotten off to a good start. So we'll see how things unfold. All right, let's talk good news here. St. Louis Blues are 5-0, and best record they've ever had from the start of the season. And the one word I keep hearing, and everyone seems to look at them and say, well, there's one word, depth. This team mm-hmm. is deep up front. Uh, the defense, I think, has played well. Um, I wouldn't say that they're the stalwart of this hockey club, but overall this team from top to bottom is is deep and they're playing with that confidence that we always hear about. Yeah, Claves, I'm so glad you and I are talking because I wanted to talk with you because you're you're my you're my history buff. You've seen this Blues team throughout history, but Curbs and I were talking about this on the broadcast the other night, and I, I don't know a deeper roster that the Blues have had in my time that I can think of. The one that comes to mind is before they traded for Keith Kachuk when they had Michael Hanzus, Ladislav Nagy, Lubis Barteshko. Those were like the fourth line players, but the difference between that team and this team is I don't know if I could have believed somebody to say, oh, yeah, well, Lubis Barteshko could be a 20-goal scorer in the season for the Blues. I, I could look at somebody in the eye and say Jake Neighbors, Clem Costin, Tyler Bozak, they could put 15 goals up this season for St. Louis. I'll tell you one team that kind of remind the 80-81 team, and if you get a chance, I, I, I'd ask Bernie for Durko. I mean, they had guys like Tony Kerr at 20 goals. I mean, they had a lot of 20-goal yep. scores. Uh, very solid goaltending with Mike Liu. Uh, it was a really, really deep team, in my opinion. Uh, and I, you know, that's something I'd ask Bernie about. And that, that would be the team I would compare them to. Um, but, you know, when you look at them from top to bottom, I think the one thing that I always look at and wonder about is the physical presence that they, they, they are going to need at some point. Yeah. Um, that that's lacking. I, I don't need Braden Shin fighting every night. Uh, and they don't have anybody else that's willing or has that skill set where you can throw them in there every night because even the fourth line competition is very stiff right now. You know, we saw Kyle Clifford play on Saturday night. Kyle Clifford's a guy that has got to find a way to create energy when he does play. And, and to be honest with you, he had some pretty good shifts on Saturday night for a guy yeah. who hasn't played a great deal. But when it's all said and done, that's going to be an area where they're going to have to have a little bit more physical presence. Bartuzzo handles things on the back end, but I think up front you're going to need somebody because I think somebody's going to get tired of Barbashev and some other guys running them all over the ice, and they're going to want to right or wrong, and the Blues are going to have to find a way to respond. But that's down the road. I think overall it's been a fun run so far. Yeah, you know the part that I love about this team, Claves, is they, they're back to that Craig Berube identity that we saw in 18-19. Mm-hmm. I mean, just from these first five games, it seems like every time there's a person in the line of another player, they're going to finish their check. Like Clem Costin, Jake Neighbors, Pavel Buchnevich. I mean, these guys are going through players. And what that has done is that's created four check opportunities. That's creative offensive zone time. You know, I was the game against the, the, the Kings, they would dump the puck in. And last year they dumped the puck in and they would try and get it, but then they would just play in the neutral zone. This year, they dump the puck in, and there are three guys hounding that puck behind the net. Four check, physical play, finishing the checks. It's creating sustained offensive zone time. This Blues team just, for me, feels like they're not taking any slack this year compared to last year where it was guys that were just trying to out-finesse the other team, and it feels like it's just a buy-in back into the, oh, yeah, this is how we win hockey games. It's we punish the opposition. Yeah, um, you make a very good point. I, I think the qu- the question will be, because we kind of saw this last year at the start, and they got off to a hot start, um, can they keep this up? And yeah. this is where depth comes into play. Um, you, you better have a guy or two in the minors who can come up and give you a breather. And I know Dakota Joshua, who I know Craig Berube likes a great deal, is going to get a call up. And, you know, we're going to see what he can do. But I, I think if you're a guy that's playing in the minors, Peredovich is another guy, uh, stay ready, man, because I, I really believe that this is a team that's going to need extra bodies uh, more than what they have on the current roster. Yeah, internal competition, Clips. We've seen it throughout the years. It makes the best of hockey teams when 
guys are always looking over their shoulder, wondering if somebody's going to come up like Jake neighbors, Clem cost. And they made this roster. But as you mentioned, Dakota, Josh was getting the call up with the COVID situation for Ryan O'Reilly and Brandon sod. But on top of it, Logan Brown has scored two goals already in the Springfield Thunderbirds organization. Mackenzie McEachern, who's been an NHL player, is down in the minors. And you also got a Nikita Alexandrov who's been scoring goals. So they have plenty of depth right now that could challenge for NHL roster spots. And I think that's why we're getting the play we're getting from these younger guys, because they know this isn't going to last much longer for me if I don't play at the top of my game. Clem Costin, I think, is a perfect example, Claves. He had a, a brutal preseason. He even said that like he was no good this preseason, and he just wasn't noticeable. I mean, for me, he was one of those guys that was pretty obvious he was going to be playing in the AHL, but Clem went to Craig Berube and the coaching staff and said, look, I was no good in preseason. I promise you I'll be better if I get this opportunity. And lo and behold, his first game, he scores two goals. And ever since that game against the Arizona Coyotes, every single night he's been noticeable in my opinion. But I think that's because of the threat of, you could go down at the AHL at any time because there are guys that are capable of playing third or fourth line roles. Yeah, that, that's that's a great point you make. You better stay ready. And and I and you know you and I've talked about Costin before. Yeah. I just don't know what he is. I mean, physically he's got some tools. Um, he he has a little bit of a touch. He's a decent skater. Uh, I like the way he finishes checks. I think he's just trying to figure out what is his strong suit and how can I grow that. So it, it's fun right. to watch. All right, before we get out of here, a couple other things I want to ask you about. Uh, give me your impression of the league so far. I know it's early. Uh, with regard to how things are going, anything surprising you, anything that we need to start paying closer attention to other than being on the COVID list? Because I get the feeling, Alex, this is not going to be an isolated situation, and there may be a team or teams that go down, and if they do, uh, I'm not sure where you go from here, um, it's, especially when it comes to forfeitures and, and how that's going to work. Do you massage the roster enough where you can bring up guys? But if you do that, you're going to deplete your minor league system, and those guys are going to have to find some players to play. And I just don't know if the chain is deep enough for them to be able to do all of this. Well, and especially for how some teams are run right now, Claves. I mean, look at the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Toronto Maple Leafs have done so much of, well, let's give 11, 12, 13 million dollars to this individual player. But the problem is, well, guess what? When that player is unavailable to play because of COVID or an injury situation, you're calling up a college goaltender to be the guy for you in a backup role because you don't have enough money to make it work. It gives you an appreciation for what Doug Armstrong has done with this team because in any scenario, they're able to move around some money and bring somebody up rather than be the Vegas Golden Knights, the Colorado Avalanche, Toronto Maple Leafs, who have to basically plug and play with college players at the minimum contract because they don't have enough to go. Um, other than that, because I do think that's an interesting storyline, Klaibs, I would tell people to keep an eye on the Minnesota Wild. Um, I know people came into this season and said, well, Colorado's the best team in the Central, and the Arizona Coyotes will be the worst, and then everyone else is in the middle. For me... Colorado is still going to be a really good team, but I think the St. Louis Blues are on the same level as Colorado this season. But I think Minnesota is going to be right there beneath them. They play a heavy style under Bill Guerin. They've moved on from former leaders of the team, and they've put new players in place. I just like the youth that they are doing with Minnesota right now, and I think the Wild are going to be a very dangerous team to deal with this season. And on top of that, on the Eastern Conference side, which I know we don't see a whole lot of, I don't know if Tampa is the clear-cut favorite anymore. I think the Florida Panthers are the clear-cut favorite in the Eastern Conference. Hmm. Now that they have now that they have more implementation of Joel Quenville's system, they brought in the grizzled vets like Joe Thornton, they've re-upped the longtime leaders in Barkov and Ekblad, and they brought in some, some outside noise that can help them. So I think Florida is the clear-cut favorite the clear cut favorite this year in the Eastern conference. You know, I look at Florida, I look at the Islanders. I, I still consider Tampa a viable threat. The yeah. Capitals are a team that I think we always pay attention to. And then I think there's a real drop off as far as competition. And you mentioned the Maple Leafs, um, their goaltending situation is yet to be resolved. Um, yeah. they, and you know, that as you said, they threw a lot of money into a few players. So um, things have to change there. Montreal is kind of in a quandary. Um, without Weber and a few other people, um, that's a team that's still trying to find their way, especially when you don't have Carey Price. So it, it's going to take some teams a while to figure out if they're good or not. And as you know, I don't really 
assess teams until we get to mid January where we've had the hot streaks, cold streaks, the injuries and everything else. And obviously COVID's going to have an impact. So I would say stay tuned, but it's, it's interesting to see how some teams have gotten off to a good start. And then you have the Phoenix, uh, the Arizona Coyotes and those also <laughs> Rams who you knew weren't going to be very good from the start. <laughs> Yeah, the Arizona Coyotes are so interesting. They moved on from the, the two impactful players that gave the Blues fits and Garland and Ekman Larson. And then now they got Phil Kessel who's saying, I want out because he knows it's a rebuild. So Arizona is going to be one of those teams that I think some people will look over. They still have the talent to make you pay, but Arizona might be in for a long year, but Chicago is going to be fighting there with them. Yeah. I, I came up with something fun to do for, for our Ferrario faceoffs. I got a Ferrario stat of the day for you. You ready All for right. this one? I'm ready. Clem Costin and Jake Neighbors both have more goals than Mitch Marner of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Ouch. $11 million for him and about $750,000 for each of Costin and Jake Neighbors. That shows you how bad it is in Toronto right now. And you know what? They they really howl when their team isn't doing well. So I would imagine right now talk radio and, and just the writers there are having a field day and what's going on and you hope that they can hold on because it's a it's a, a a storied franchise. But I say that only to say they've gone longer without the cup than anybody in the history of hockey. Uh, what is it, fifty five years now that they've yep. gone without a cup? They haven't been in the finals in fifty five yep. years. They, they think about that for a minute. Yep. Think about all the teams that have come in this league and they've all gone to the finals with the exception of the Maple Leafs. So it's Clips. uh. Clips, it's the Arizona rough. Coyotes. The Arizona Coyotes were what, like two wins away from going to a Stanley Cup final, like yeah. five or six years ago. That tells you how bad it is if you're Toronto. Well, I say stay tuned. Uh, that thing could get ugly before it gets better. All right, hey Alex, always good visiting with you, sir. We will do this again in the very near future uh, because as we have hockey on and off, we'll we'll find some days where we get it up and going. But it's good to visit with you, and we'll have some fun guests and some fun things that we'll do along the course of the season. So we thank you for your time. We thank our viewers and listeners as well. We look forward to talking to everybody again in our next episode of Ferrario Faceoff right here on ClavesOnline.com.